diversity as well. It can, our group can only flourish with the members that we have, and hopefully our new members that we might get to tonight. Our next speaker has travelled from Ireland to be here with us. She's the Health and Education Officer with the Transgender Equality Network of Ireland. Over the years, her work has focused on developing supports for trans people and also their families. She lived in London in the 1980s and is here with us tonight to highlight the need for London Irish trans supports. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Vanessa Lacey. Uh, thanks, Helen, and thanks for the, the invite to vote for Embassy. I'm the ambassador and provide especially a clear for the invite here. It's absolutely, I'm absolutely delighted and honoured to receive the invite. And it's just a pleasure to be here. Um, myself, I was born in Waterford. As Ronnie Corbett once said, that, uh, I was born at a very young age. <laughs> but, um, I, I was born in 1964 in Waterford City. And from my very, very first memory, um, I, I knew it was something very, very different about me. Um, but as I expressed myself, as I expressed who I was, it was frowned upon. And it was probably frowned upon to protect me by my parents. But I conformed, I suppose I conformed to what my family wanted, I conformed, I suppose, to what society wanted. And out of that, I created a facade, a persona. And from that time, I became, I suppose it was two sets of clothes I wore. One was isolation, and one was fear. I was feared, I was afraid to, to reveal the real me, because I knew it was frowned upon. And I had a self-imposed isolation because of the fear, so I hid on that. So I grew up, I suppose, as a pre prebetal child, and, and again, I hid, hid, hid all that inside of me. <coughs> Coming into puberty was quite different, because it, it actually exacerbated the anxiety in me, and I felt quite worse. I failed every exam I ever sat, and at the age of 14, I left, um, I left school which was Delisal Boys School in Morton City, because I couldn't concentrate on what I was doing. I went straight into employment, and during uh, that massive recession in, in the late 80s, I, I then moved to London in 1987. It's ironic that 25 years ago, um, I applied for a passport, a male passport, in this building. So it's, a mad, it's just amazing that 25 years later, I'm back with my female passport. <laughs> so in 1987, as I said, I moved here and I spent four fantastic years in England. But again, I kept the fear, the clothes of the fear and isolation on me. I, I did go to a couple of clubs at that time, but I just felt they weren't for me. And still, I hid it because I was afraid of what, I suppose, society would have felt. I felt a bit comfortable here, and I was afraid to, to take down that facade on me in case people would see what I was. And especially 25 years ago, that would have been certainly frowned upon to be trans. I mean, now things seem to be taking a major, major step with fantastic advocates, trans advocates. But at that time, I still had that fear. I met my first partner around that time, and it was my very first partner when I was 23 years of age. Uh, she was female, and um, a couple of years into that relationship, I broke down, and she was the very, very first person that I told that I was transgender. Shortly afterwards, that relationship ceased to be. So I returned back to Ireland. After a few weeks, I met the mother of my two wonderful boys. I now have two wonderful boys. My oldest is 17 and my youngest is 13 and a half. My youngest boy lives with me. And I have a fantastic relationship there. But again, that marriage broke down because of my gender identity, unfortunately. We still have a wonderful relationship, but again, it was the facade. I brought the facade into that relationship. I was kind of like a twin person. Myself was always inside of my heart and my mind, but the facade was so there's three people in the relationship, and then my two children, five people in the family. One was a persona, it was not a human being. 
Seven years ago, um, I could not live that life anymore. <coughs> and I was breaking down, and as Barnard would certainly maybe relate to, I spent an awful lot of time in the church. I spent an awful lot of time crying. I spent an awful lot of time just looking for some hope. But there was no hope seemed to be there. But in a glimmer, what happened is I thought maybe to go and educate myself. So then I went to work at the city library and looked through the books and anything on transgenderism or transgender issues and it was moving. But on the way out of that building, I saw it the very first sign. It was for a support group for lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender. The very first time I've ever seen a sign for a transgender. So I ran that moment. I'm delighted to say at the very first phone call to the helpline that it was answered. And it was answered by a very special person who was actually in this room tonight. won't be mentioned. But it has to be mentioned. Through that, and that certainly saved my life, because at that time I was certainly one of them percentages that was uh, contemplating suicide. In Ireland at the moment, uh, statistics would show from a report in 2012 that 78% of transgender people have contemplated suicide. 40% of that 78% have attempted suicide at least once. When you think the Irish national average for suicide is 1.6%, it's quite stark to think that 30% of the Irish transgender people are or have attempted suicide. We have a system of healthcare in Ireland who is somewhat, in relation to transgender needs, is somewhat haphazard, but certainly learning very, very fast. We would certainly have um, very, very close connections with the UK in that regard because we do not have the expertise or experience. So we will have a system over in Ireland called the Treatment Abroad Scheme, where people who are undergoing treatments that is not in Ireland they would be sent by a specialist to the UK. I'm happy to say, and I've met with one of the most wonderful people today, a clinical nurse and endocrinologist in the Charing Cross Hospital that we do directly to, and with. I, I was quite honoured to, to meet her and be part of that team, but also quite privileged to have undergone a, a life-saving surgery that I felt I needed at that time. However, that three years ago when I first went into that system, when I was referred over to Charing Cross Hospital, I felt very, very isolated. I felt very isolated on my, my pre-operative meeting just before I underwent surgery. I was already after losing all my family because I came out as transgender. I lost many friends, but then again I wouldn't really call them friends if they weren't standing by me, but I gained them so many fantastic, genuine friends because of how they accepted me who I was without a facade. But that three years ago, or two and a half years ago, when I knew finally I was going to be the person that I was. I was the person that I was up here, but I was not the person that I was, I felt, until I undergone the procedure. But when I came out of that preoperative assessment, I was devastated because I lost my mum, my dad, I was my family, and I was alone in them. And I walked up the road to an Italian restaurant and I cried for half an hour because I was on my own. And that kind of something that I talked talk, talk about quite a lot because six weeks after that I went in for surgery. Again, I was on my own. The wonderful staff of Charing Cross were absolutely fantastic and were there always at hand. But again, I did not have that connection. So that is why it's such an honour and pleasure to be here today and have to receive that wonderful invite from Mind Yourself and from Cecily and Claire in relation to now that wheel could be turned a little bit. Whereas that fantastic London based organisation that works with Irish people can be there to support the next people that come over and get treated in Charing Cross Hospital. So, you know, I, I don't. I suppose come places without an objective. I always have an objective in my back pocket. And I would like to think and certainly hope that, and I spoke to uh, Ify Middleton from Charing Cross today, and I would 
certainly hope that in the future, um, either volunteers or staff members of, of Mindyourself would be able to commit within lonely people coming out from Ireland who have maybe lost their family, who have contemplated suicide, who have attempted suicide, as a hope, as a hope for them there that they could take off their clothes of isolation and fear and be themselves and be supported as the human beings that they are. Because that is at the end of the day. And just to echo what you first said, Ambassador, about diversity. Last Tuesday, I was very, very proud to be part of an Exploring Diversity Conference in the City. As part of that, and that, that built from a strategy of Exploring Diversity and Integration Ireland, and it was very much one of the first that was held in Waterford. I'm really blowing Waterford's trumpet. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, there was poetry people there, there was African people there, disabled people there, there was travellers groups there, LGBT groups and transgender groups were part of the strategy. But I'm just absolutely delighted to say that the next step in that strategy is celebrating diversity. We were going to hold this and host this maybe in 12 months time as part of the, uh, the celebrations of what the city being 1100 years old in the city in Ireland. So I'm delighted to say that we're part of that. I'm delighted to say that we're all integration together because at the end of the day, as I said on Tuesday, all of us, we've got so much more similarities than we have differences. We all have our differences, we all have our diversity, but we're not aliens, we are human beings, and we are loving human beings. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be here today, quite honored, and thank you once more.